come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Hear international presenter Gordon Gossett and travel with him to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. I want to welcome you in the audience and those that are watching on screen to our series called Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. This is a series of audio-visual presentations where we look at ancient texts, we look at archaeology, we look at university history, and we see that some very ancient mysteries can reveal a very real future for us here today. In fact, these mysteries will reveal your future. Okay, welcome back to session three of Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. In fact, not just ancient mysteries, but this little ancient book we're finding has a lot to say about the future. And we're going to be having the second part of our session on Matthew 24. It's called Part 2, Pompeii. How near is the end? How near is the end? I want to take you to the ancient city of Pompeii. We've all heard of Pompeii. It was a um, holiday resort, if you like, for the Romans. It was a pa place of pleasure. There was large homes. There was the forum and the, the marketplace where people would come and, and they would buy their, um, their goods, their souvenirs from, from Pompeii. They had wool merchants there. Wool was a very expensive commodity in those days. They had a bakery, of course, and they had fast food shops. This was the first McDonald's. And not far down the road was the first Burger King. Because when people are on holiday, you don't want to be making food. They would just go and buy their fast food, much like today. They had a theatre. The theatre was a wee bit different than our theatre today because there they would go and watch people actually fight to the death. And that was called entertainment. And the sports arena, similar things would take place. The bathhouse, they were very into having communal baths and saunas and spas. And of course, they had numerous brothels throughout the, the city. When you go there, some of the uh, graffiti or just the signs in the brothels are fairly explicit. But there's one that stands out. Somebody has written Sodom and Gomorrah in one of the brothels. Clearly, a Jewish person, because only a Jewish person would know about those ancient cities in biblical literature. They had temples, they had... Religion of every type. People could worship according to the dictates of their conscience. Because, you know, when you're living the high life, a lascivious, lascivious life, it's party, party, central, all night, having a ball, they thought. A bit of religion's good for the soul, isn't it? But when you consider the sort of religion they had, there was a lot of licentiousness in it. There was temple prostitutes, both male and female, and some of the rites in these religions were not such as we would find uh, acceptable today. When we went there, it was an exceptional day. I have never in my life been in such heavy rain. You can see two of the people on the tour with me, they were having to stand on those rocks because that pathway became a river. It rained giant drops of rain. And billions of them per square metre, it felt like. And we just got, we got absolutely drenched, even in the raincoats. And we only had a limited number of umbrellas. Everybody at the end of that was totally drenched. So we didn't enjoy our trip. But I can tell you, friends, it wasn't as bad having big raindrops coming down upon us as what happened for the people that used to live in Pompeii. Because behind Pompeii, it's shadowed by this mountain. The mountain is called Vesuvius. And in the year 62 AD, there was a Vesuvius rumbled. And there was a great earthquake throughout Pompeii. Many of the buildings were destroyed. The theatres, the brothels, the sports arenas, the forum. And the people picked themselves up and they rebuilt the city. And in no time it was back to party central. But Vesuvius had given them a warning in 62 AD. The buildings that, that, that you see today, you can even see some of the earthquake repairs. You can see the old city 
and then the new city where it was built on top of it. But in 79 AD, Vesuvius erupted for a second time. And this time, it was fatal for everybody living in that city. All the people perished. August 24th, 79 AD. The people had time to leave from when the mountain started rumbling until it blew its top on August 24. And people were covered as the mountain rained down ash and rock and poisonous gas upon them. Way worse than the rain that we experienced. And the city was never rebuilt after that. And today we have all the remnants of that ancient city after the earthquake where the people failed to heed the warnings and we find their, these encrusted shells of where their bodies lay covered with ash. Let's go to Jerusalem now, 2,000 years ago, where we finished in our last, series, our last section of this program. We talked about Jesus making some predictions. And he made predictions concerning Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish people. We saw that. Were those predictions fulfilled? Absolutely. Every single one of them. The very details of one stone not being left upon another. The Gentiles occupying the city. They were all fulfilled. But that's not all Jesus had to say. Because the disciples said on the Mount of Olives, tell us when these things will be. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Jesus didn't say anything about the end of the world. Remember what we talked about? The Jews, uh, the disciples said to Jesus, look at this building, Lord. You just said you're going to knock it down and build it in three days. They were perplexed by what he said. And his answer was, I'll tell you what, there's not going to be one of these giant stones left upon another that won't be thrown down. Then when they get out to the Mount of Olives, they ask Jesus, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Did Jesus mention the end of the world? He didn't. He simply said that the temple was going to be thrown down. And for the Jewish mind, it was impossible to differentiate between the temple being destroyed and the end of the world. It had, the only way that temple could be destroyed would be the end of the world for them. So they asked these questions and Jesus then answers he mingled his answers up. Some that we looked at were to do with the temple being destroyed and the Jewish nation. But he has another set of answers dealing with their other question. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? And so Jesus gave signs for us living in the end of the world when we will know that that's taking place, when it's coming about. That we might know that we're on the very edge of eternity. Number one sign that he gave, there are signs in the natural world, there's going to be earthquakes. Jesus said there's going to be earthquakes as a sign. People say, well, there's always, be, always been earthquakes. You read the Bible, you read any ancient text, and it will talk about the time when the earthquake happened. Because that was such an unusual event for an earthquake to happen. Time was delineated between earthquakes. He said there will be earthquakes in various places. We've had them in Haiti. Christchurch, Japan, and Nepal. I must tell you, I was uh, running a seminar similar to this in a place called Ashburton, south of Christchurch, 50 miles south of Christchurch. And I was talking about the signs of Christ's second coming. We were in the local town hall building on the second floor, and I said, one of the signs is that there's going to be earthquakes. This was in September. Oh, no, November, sorry, after we'd had the September earthquake. And as I said earthquakes, the building started moving. <laughs> we had got a really serious aftershock. And everybody was quite used to aftershocks in Canterbury by that time, and everybody just rode it out. And I said, that is not the special effects department, but they couldn't have done it better. <laughs> I said earthquakes, and we got one. <laughs> Where's the earthquake now? Does it really adds impetus when you talk about earthquakes and you get one. But Christchurch is familiar with them. Japan, Nepal. The earthquakes are increasing, though. People say there's always been earthquakes. Let's just have a look at the numbers. In the first 10 years of the 20th century, that's 1900 to 1910, how many earthquakes do you think there was? There was 18 in a 10-year period recorded over six. 
by the end of the century, the last 10 years of the 20th century, there was 42 recorded earthquakes over six. That's an increase, isn't it? And people might say, the sceptic might say, but Gordon, they've got better recording instruments at the end of the 20th century than the beginning of the 20th century. That does not explain what takes place in the next 10 years. The first 10 years of the 21st century, there was 217 quakes, not over six, but over seven. They don't count them as over six anymore as being big ones. Is that an increase, friends? 42 over six. The following 10 years, 217 quakes over seven. Do you think the ground is speaking to us, telling us, it's time to get ready. There's going to be famines. Jesus said there will be famines in the world. I'm going to just make a statement now, and you're going to hear it. But friends, how can we even comprehend such a horrible reality? 24,000 human beings die every day from hunger. That's one every 3.6 seconds that's a staggering reality don't you believe that's what and jesus said that was going to be a sign in the last days 50 500 plus million people are desperate for a meal today and 925 million will go to bed tonight hungry this world is in a terrible situation why do we have such famines when you just look at the statistics, it's not hard to understand the reason why. This is a figure of world population growth. You may be able to see the markers on the screen there. By 1650, the year 1650, we had 500 million people occupying this planet. Half a billion people. That's going to be, remember that figure. It's going to be a relevant figure when we talk about the further identity of the little horn later on. 500 million people living on the planet. By 1800, the world's population had doubled to 1 billion people. By 1900, just before 1900, it had increased, it had doubled again. Four times what we had in 1650, it's now 2 billion people. And since 1900, where are we today? Heading to 7.5 billion people. What an exponential growth in world population. Do you see that? It's amazing. And all these signs, they all seem to get to about 1800 and go on an upward rise. Everything we talked about, earthquakes, if you graph everything, the graph is exactly the same, except for one thing, the reverse graph. Farm, a pasture and farmland, the area that's being used for growing food to feed us is going down every year as the population is going up. That's a crisis. That's a crisis happening for sure, don't you think? We're growing less food and we've got more mouths to feed. Terrible crisis. Jesus said there will be distress of nations and and perplexity with the sea and the waves roaring, tsunamis, cyclones and floods. Have they increased? For many of us here in our lifetime, tsunamis were something that happened somewhere else in the Pacific, and you never heard about them. But have tsunamis increased? We're all familiar with the Asian tsunamis, and nations are anxious about terrifying events taking place around the world. Jesus predicted with 100% accuracy, friends, the things that are taking place today. The second sign is signs in the political world. Signs in the political world. He said, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. There's 30 wars going on on this planet every year. 30 wars. People say, oh, but there's always been wars. It's a bit like earthquakes. There's 100 million spent globally on war... Every hour. Not every year, but every hour. Every hour. They spend enough to clothe and feed and house everybody in these developing nations, the ones that are starving to death. 
every 17 minutes. The world's in, in a terrible crisis. There's 80 times more spent on war than is needed to provide water and sanitation to the world. There's 27,000 nuclear bombs in stock. How many of them do we need to wipe us all out? <laughs> There's international global conflicts. Jesus said, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The nations were angry. Last century alone, 180 million people died in warfare. More than the rest of the world's the history of the world put together. 180 million people killed in warfare. And then there's this global threat, uh, threat of nuclear conflict. People are terrified because of the ability of nations, rogue nations. Iran, North Korea, we talk about getting nuclear weapons. I'm not happy for anybody to have them because if anybody lets them off, we all get affected. There's... There's ongoing conflict between Israel and Iran. And then there's a conflict between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. I think the biggest problem is who's got the worst haircut. But Donald Trump is battling against Kim Jong-un, but he's also battling against his other enemy, CNN. There's a war going on in the media as well today. We get told what they want us to hear. The threat of terrorist nuclear attack is causing many people to go to sleep at night and find sleep escaping them because of the terror in their hearts. We're quite isolated here in New Zealand, down at the bottom of the world, and this is, a, this is paradise on earth. Nobody's going to send a nuke on us, but if they nuke each other, the effect will affect us. But people that live in the, in the flight path of ICBMs find it difficult to sleep at night when the rumblings come through the, the media. We have a third sign that Jesus gave, signs in the social world. He says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. He says, Paul writes, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, Traitors, haughty, headstrong, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a, this is a scary thing, they have a form of godliness. It's not that people are devoid of religion, but they have a form of religion, but deny its power. Should have just realized I should have put a picture up when Kerry and I are at Yosemite. They've got a school in Yosemite Valley. And it's got a sign there. I couldn't believe it. Big sign saying, gun-free school zone. That's indicating that there's school zones that aren't gun-free. But they're all gun-free here. But, you know, violence in America is just growing out of control, as is the rest of the Western world. Look at the differences in school problems today. Back in the 1940s, let's look at the school problems, the top school problems, the things that could get you expelled or get you a... A detention, or back in those days, a whipping. People, I mean, this is, this is a terrible reading. People were talking in class. And if that wasn't bad enough, they were chewing gum. They were making a noise. Running in the hall. Cutting in line. It was a lawless time, the 1940s, friends. Some of them would even turn up without a uniform. That's outright rebellion. And they would litter the school. I'm pleased we don't live in the 1940s. Or am I? Because in the, year, in the 2000s, in the 21st century, these are the top school problems in the United States of America. Drug use, alcohol abuse, pregnancy, suicide, rape, robbery and assault. Is it a different world today? Or is it just me that sees that? The statistics tell us that the social world is going down the gurgler. Today, this is another... I'm just going to say something, but the reality is that these are human beings we're talking about. One in six boys and one in four girls are sexually abused 
before the age of 18. They're Australian figures. We might, go, we might say that's Australia, but the New Zealand figures are worse. Jesus gave signs in the religious world. He says, beware of false prophets. You will know them by their fruits. We had such things as the Jim Jones cult down in Guyana in South America. A Baptist preacher. He incited 900 people to follow him to Guyana. And for some reason, we know not why, they committed a mass suicide. There's the David Koresh Waco cult. There's Jewish messiahs. Marshall Applewhite and the Solar Temple, the Heaven's Gate cult. He was a religious teacher. Marshall Applewhite taught people that Jesus was coming to take his followers home and he was in a spaceship behind the hale Bop comet. And to get on that spaceship with Jesus, what you needed to do was to buy a brand new pair of Nike shoes, put your favourite clothes in a sports bag and drink some Kool-Aid laced with cyanide and commit suicide. Who wants to join up to a religion like that? But people did. And they found in these motels, these people did everywhere. In this age, we have a disbelief in the creation by God because of Darwinian evolution. Nobody believed that years ago. Peter writes, knowing this first, that in the last days... Scoffers will come and they will willingly forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old. That God created the world. That's a prediction that's never been relevant in the world until the last 160 years, friends. Everybody believed in a creator. Today, the majority of the so-called learned world discount that. That was a sign that we're living in the last days. This is, that's all bad news, but there is good news in the signs. One of the signs that we're living in the last days. is Matthew 24, 14. The spread of the gospel of God. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and the end, then the end will come. I want to share some good news with you, friends. Right now, today, we are fulfilling prophecy. You are fulfilling prophecy by being here because this gospel is being preached here today. And as it goes around the world, it's a sign. It is a sign that Jesus is coming soon. The gospel, the Christian gospel. Time magazine did an did a, um, article on it, talking about the number of adherents to Christianity. Now, the Time magazine is not a Christian magazine. But they said, if Christians, in this article, they said, if Christians believe the words of Christ... The spread of Christianity around the world today should tell them that the end is nigh. Time magazine can read the signs. South America, Philippines and Africa, the gospel is going exponentially to all these nations on the planet. India, a country once close to Christianity through the Hindu religion, is now the place where, the, where Christianity is growing faster than any other place on the planet. India. And we're talking about the true gospel, the gospel that comes from this book, not man-made teachings, not David Koresh's teachings or Marshall Applewhite teachings, but the truths of the, this book that we're going to be sharing with you over these 25 sessions. And in India, we're seeing mass baptisms happening. N unprecedented. The gospel was, India was closed to the gospel. The gospel could not enter. And yet today, we're seeing mass baptisms, massive groups of people accepting the truths of, the, of God's word. So we've seen there's global, where there's global warnings in the natural world, there's global, war, the global warnings in the political world, the social world, the religious world. What do they all mean, friends? Jesus said, when you see all these things, know that it, that's Christ coming is near. It's even at the doors, friends. Where do you think we are in the span of time? Everything's telling us we're right near the end. Time is running out. So what should be our reaction? What should we do? Did Jesus get it right about Jerusalem? 
Did he get it right about the temple? Did he get it right about the Jewish people? Did he get it right about earthquakes? Tsunamis? The moral breakdown of society? Did he get it right? The answer is an overwhelming yes. There's only one thing to be fulfilled and that's that last empire coming, friends. Do you think he's right about that? I certainly do. That's why I'm here today. What should our reaction be? Luke tells us, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something to be joyful about. Something to look forward to. Because God's empire is about to take over. And what did we see last night? What is God's empire all about? No tears, no pain, no sorrow, no death. For the former things have passed away. Let's just go back and have, get an illustration from Pompeii again. August 24th, 79 AD. The mountains started to rumble again in the morning. The people went, ooh. The ground moved a little there. And then as it quietened and a wee bit, a few whiffs of smoke came out of the mountaintop. They just went about their business. They went to their parties. I mean, you're on holiday. That's what you do when you're on holiday. You party. They went to their, their games. They went and watched their sports. Some went to the psychics to find out what the rumbling meant. I know those psychics, psychics didn't know what the rumbling meant. How do I know? Because if they'd have known, they would have been scarfering. They wouldn't have been in their little booth, would they? They'd have been out of there if they'd have known the future. People went to the psychics. And then in the afternoon, Vesuvius erupted. People fled to these gates, but it was too late. There was no getting away. The smoke overtook them, and their bodies were found centuries later where they fell, encased in ash. The forum where people had been shopping for the latest goods. The bodies were found around the forum. In the bakery, they found bread, nearly 2,000 years old. Baked by the heat, it's now petrified. I've seen some of the loaves of bread. The bread is still there to this very day, and the people were too late to get it. Some went to their temples. Some were going to their temples for their licentious worship, worship services, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, when it was too late to flee. This man, his name is Zandos, we know, that was his house. He had a lot of art treasures. Maybe he went back to get one of them before he fled and he never got out of his lounge. Today, that place stands as a testimony, as a memorial to what it means to not take action when you're given the warning signs. They failed to heed the warning messages Today we've got all these signs in the natural world, the political world, the social and the religious worlds. Are we listening? Or are we like Pompeii? What should we do? What should we do? Scripture says, but watch yourselves in case your hearts be weighted down with partying, drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come on you unexpectedly. Nobody in this room, having seen what we've seen today, should allow that day to come upon them unexpectedly. We should be expecting it, do you agree? So how can we be in the last empire? How can we be ready? Let's close off by going back to ancient Babylon. The archaeologists discovered this tablet. It's in the British Museum. It's tablet 34113. And that tells the story of, remember last night we talked about Nebuchadnezzar, that king. What sort of a man was he? Arrogant, proud, violent, ruthless. Remember the list? I told you what he did to Zedekiah. And this tablet records his insanity as recorded in the book of Daniel, chapter 4. If you go to chapter 4 of the book of Daniel, you open it here and you read the story. You read the story of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. And it was proven as they dug up this ancient cuneiform text telling us the same story. Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. 
this proud, self-centered, arrogant, ruthless, violent man. And he says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Who's the center of his thinking? Himself. He's got an eye problem. Well, this is what's written on his tablet. The fortifications of Esagila and Babylon I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. That's found in stone. It's exactly the same thing that he says in Daniel chapter 4 when he goes mad. He's looking at his kingdom saying, look what a great man I am. He was materialistic, idolatrous, blasphemous, ruthless. And in Daniel chapter 4, he has a dream about a tree. I'm not going to go into the whole prophecy, the whole dream here. But the, and Daniel comes in, Daniel again tells him what the dream means. And he said, it's about you again, king. And you're going to go mad. He suffered from either lycanthropy or boanthropy. He ended up becoming an animal for seven years. His hair grew, his nails grew. But the prophecy said that at the end of that seven years, you're going to get your kingdom back. Anybody who studied ancient history will know that if you went mad, you could never continue in your reign. If you lost your mind or even became weak or lost a battle, you would lose your life. It was impossible for Nebuchadnezzar to continue his reign after the seven years of madness. In fact, it would have seven days and somebody would have put the sword through him. And after seven years, he comes back to his senses. And his kingdom's given back to him. Nebuchadnezzar's got enough nous. That ruthless, materialistic, brutal man's got enough nous to know that that's not humanly possible, that there is a God in heaven. And he acknowledged the God of heaven. Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan ruler, this man who was brutal beyond belief turned his heart and says, now I honor and extol the God of heaven. All his ways are righteous. And he's able to set up kings and tear down kings and set over nations the most base of men, talking about himself. You know, Nebuchadnezzar came to know the God that interpreted his dreams. That might be news for you, but that's what happened in the scripture. Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in the last empire. I want to tell you, friends, if Nebuchadnezzar can get in there, there's room for any one of us. None of us have done, I'm sure, as much evil as Nebuchadnezzar did. But he's going to be in the last empire because he found a forever hope. He found that Daniel could not interpret the dream, and he didn't have the evidence we have today. We're looking back in history, and we see that everything that Daniel predicted has come true. Everything that Jesus predicted has come true. Nebuchadnezzar had one fulfilled prophecy, and it turned his heart. What was that prophecy? That after seven years, your kingdom will be restored. I want to read a story to you, just to illustrate it. Once upon a time, sounds like a fairy tale, but it was once upon a time in the history of Israel, they were attacked by another nation. This was the nation of Assyria. And the Assyrians were the cruelest, most brutal people on the planet in the ancient times. They were the ones that invented crucifixion. The Romans got it from them. They were the ones they were the ones that would take their captives and flay them alive. It's not something you hear much of today, but flaying means to take all of your skin off. They would skin them alive and then march them down the city street in their capital, which is called Nineveh. People would throw salt on their wounds and then they would be publicly executed. These people are attacking 
Jerusalem. They're attacking God's people. Sennacherib was their king. Sennacherib sent his Rabshakeh, his spokesman who could speak Hebrew. You'll find the story in Isaiah chapter 37. You'll also find it in the book of Chronicles and the book of Kings. The, the Rabshakeh starts to cry out to the people on the wall, what makes you think that your God is going to deliver you? Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. That your God will be able to save you. What makes him special? And they use the illustration that none of the gods of the other nations were able to deliver them. Whether it was Ava or Hamath or Sephavaim, where are those gods? Where's the gods of Samaria? It's not a bad argument. If nobody could stand against the Assyrians, what makes you think Hezekiah, what, don't let Hezekiah make you think that you can stand against us? And then he went a step too far and he said, don't let your God deceive you. And he equated the God of the Jews with their gods, which were made of stone and wood and brass, sometimes gold and silver. He said, don't think that your God is going to save you. And they started to abuse the God of Daniel, the God of this book. And they found out who he was, because in the morning, 185,000 soldiers were dead. The Assyrian army was dead. And Sennacherib, he survives, but he goes back with his tail between his legs. A defeated king. He goes back to his, to his nation and he starts to worship oh, sorry, his god Nisroch. He goes back to his nation. I'm going to read from verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord smote, uh, went forth, sorry, the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch his god, that Adrimelech and Shariazer his sons, his who, friends? His sons, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esarhaddon and his son reigned in his stead. What was the end of Sennacherib, this great Assyrian king? Killed at the hand of his own sons because he had lost the battle. What chance was there for Nebuchadnezzar to gain his kingdom back? It's an absolute impossibility. But it happened, and he became a man of God. He found a forever hope, and he will be in the last empire. I just want to share with you, just for a couple of moments... That what happened for Nebuchadnezzar can happen for all of us. My own testimony. When I read the list of character traits of that man, Nebuchadnezzar, I was never the king of a great nation. But was I arrogant? Tick. Was I ruthless? Tick. Was I materialistic? Tick. Was I self-seeking? Tick. Every character trait of Nebuchadnezzar's, that was who I was. And I climbed to the top of the heap of the criminal lifestyle I was involved with, only to find that it was a a great heap of bovine fecal matter after all. But through my journey, I started to look at things like archaeology, and found out that this book, I don't have time to tell you the story, it would take two hours, but I found out that this book was historically accurate. I found prophecies concerning ancient civilizations to be valid. I found that there was dependable predictions and a proven track record. This book, I discovered that it teaches us things about how to live well that science is only just discovering today. You know, friends, as I discovered that, I discovered answers to things that had happened in my life. 
throughout my life. And I can't give you the details. But there was a force looking after me as there was a force looking after Nebuchadnezzar. And I called it the thing. That thing would do amazing things like blind the eyes of police officers as they searched my house. That thing kept me out of jail, kept me from being killed and kept me from killing anybody. That thing spoke through me in 1982 in Wellington. I had no idea what the thing was. But as I opened this book, friends, I realised the thing was not a force. Rather, it was a person. It was the God of heaven. It was the same Jesus that gave those predictions. And when I realised, based on all that evidence, I gave him permission to change my life. I asked the question, is anybody out there? And I've got the answer for you, friends. Is somebody out there? Daniel could not have made those predictions himself. He could never have guessed the future of this world with such unerring accuracy. Jesus could not have told us what was going to take place in Jerusalem for the temple and for the Jews in, in the last days of this world's history. That's not humanly possible, and it's not humanly possible. It takes divine help. And friends, you can find divine help in your life. There is somebody out there, and that somebody loves you. The Bible prophecy brought me peace, hope, and I tell you, more than anything else, a purpose to life. Over and above serving self and my own pleasures and my own materialistic dreams and goals, it brought me purpose to life. And I tell you, friends, he can bring purpose to your life. That's what all this is about. It's about knowing that there's somebody that's telling you thing, these things because he cares for you. Our next program. I'm sure many of you have read Dan Brown's famous novel, The Da Vinci Code. Well, we're going to decode the Da Vinci Code in our next program called The Curse of the Forbidden Prophecy. And we're going to see how some important information is being withheld from us. You do not want to miss this enlightening presentation. We will see you then.